Sunday was this last Sunday? Trinity Sunday. Uh, and uh, the funny story with Trinity Sunday is that um, it's been Trinity Sunday. The Sunday after Pentecost has been Trinity Sunday for 700 years or so. Uh, but uh, when the Pope said, uh, you guys are all going to have Trinity Sunday, um, and your gospel reading is going to be Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, the German Christians said no. Uh, because up to this point, the Sunday after Pentecost had been called the Octave of Pentecost, and the gospel reading was always John chapter 3, which is what we heard. Uh, so it was the German Christians that said, no, we like John chapter 3. You know, the Pope can take a hike. Uh, or really what they did is we'll, we'll, they said, well, we'll have Trinity Sunday, but we're still going to have John chapter 3 as the gospel, which is what we did. So um, that would be like if you went to the Catholic Church on Sunday or most Missouri Synod churches, they would have had Matthew 28. We had John chapter 3. That's just how it is. And so you'll hear that in the prayer here, uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we poor sinners confess that nothing good dwells in us. And if left to ourselves, we must perish in sin and eternal death, since that which is born of the flesh is flesh and cannot see your kingdom. But we beseech you to be gracious and merciful and send your Holy Spirit into our hearts for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and make of us new men, that we may confidently believe in the forgiveness of sins through Christ as promised to us at our baptism, and daily increase in charity toward our neighbor and in all other Christian virtues, until at last we obtain salvation. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I have one or two more of these. Does anybody else need uh, one of these? Got one back here. You got one? Good. Excellent. Yes, so we made it all the way through the introduction last time where we looked at, you know, kind of a very broad overview of some of the other denominations that we'll run into uh, throughout this Bible study. Uh, we had ones that, you know, are less familiar to us, like the Eastern Orthodox Church. There are a few of them around here, but uh, none in Jessup. Uh, then from the time of the Reformation, we have, of course, ourselves, uh, we have the Reformed, and that would include like uh, the Presbyterians, or if you go to Independence, there is an Episcopalian church there. Um, that would fall under the Reformed. Uh, and then the Anabaptists, we kind of see those a lot in the form of the Amish around here. Um, I shared last week that in North Dakota, they also have uh, Hutterites, which would fall under this. Uh, Mennonites, there, there are Mennonites around here. Um, Faith and I were in Cedar Falls this week, and I think it's a Presbyterian church just south of downtown, south of uh, our Redeemer, that on their sign, I guess there's a Mennonite congregation that meets there. Uh, I thought that, that was interesting. Uh, and then from the time of the Counter-Reformation, we talked last week that the Roman Catholic Church, as we understand, as you know, we see it now, you know, didn't exist until you know, this Counter-Reformation, where they reacted strongly to the Lutheran Reformation, um, and kind of what we experience now is, is that. Uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church we know now is in some ways very different from the way it used to be. So uh, we'll hear that reference throughout this study. Um, then we had the Baptists and the Wesleyans, and then the liberal church bodies. We talked about those last week. Um, are there any go-backs or any questions from last week before we dive into the study proper? Okay. Um, there are, of course, other denominations um, that you'll find in Christianity. These, this isn't the definitive list, but uh, this is a big group of, of families that includes other ones, so uh, we should be all right. So... You should have a page that looks kind of like this that starts, and God said. Uh, this will be the beginning of our study. And uh, do you all have Bibles somewhere around you? Um, I got a Bible here. 
Won't crack. Otherwise, I can swing back and get one. Because we will need that. We will need Bibles. Okay. It says, uh, Marcellus, uh, shall I strike at it with my long, heavy sword? Horatio, do if it will not stand. Bernardo, tis here. Horatio, tis here. Marcellus, tis gone. Uh, I guess that's from uh, some of the opening words of Hamlet. The ghost of Hamlet's father disappears at will and reappears only to have his son revenge his murder. Like the ghost, the gods of most religions seem interested in humanity only when it suits their own purposes. Selfish and self-serving, they enter and exit the stage of human history at their convenience. Is there a God? How do we know? How can we know what God is like? How does God relate to people in general and to me specifically? Questions like these are at the heart of almost every religion, including Christianity. The answers to them also form the heart and basis of our lives. So this is our first question for today. It says, we often hear this phrase, actions speak louder than words. Uh, what does this phrase mean? Uh, you know, and do actions speak louder than words? Uh, maybe what would you say? What does this phrase mean? First of all, actions speak louder than words. What is meant by actions? Yeah, what is meant by actions? Stuff you do, yeah, or don't do, uh, depending on it. Uh, what in general does the phrase mean? Actions speak louder than words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Because what you do holds more value than what you say. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. What you do holds more value than uh, what you say. Right? Um, to think of a biblical example, this coming Sunday we're going to have the rich man and Lazarus. That's the gospel reading, the rich man and Lazarus. And, uh, you know, the rich man, he ends up dying and going to hell, uh, Lazarus dies and goes to heaven, right? Uh, and uh, the rich man has this conversation with Abraham where he wants Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool, cool his tongue, right? And Abraham says, doesn't work that way. Uh, so then the rich man uh, says, well, then send Lazarus to, to my father's house because I've got five brothers, you know, uh, because they'll certainly listen to somebody who comes back to the, from the dead. What does Abraham then say after that? Do you remember? Well, it's not happening, but why? Yeah, Abraham says, uh, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they can be, be convinced if someone should come back from the dead. Jesus talking about himself. And, and I bring this up because I, in my sermon on Sunday, in the introduction, I'm going to talk about how a lot of times when you ask somebody, well, why does the rich man end up in hell? And they go, well, because he didn't love Lazarus. But that's not what Abraham indicates. Abraham indicates that he and his brothers are going to end up in hell because they don't have faith. They don't listen to the scriptures. So in the case of the rich man, his actions speak louder than his words, because I'm sure he went to synagogue from time to time or things like that, but uh, when it came down to it, there was nothing in there. So that's what you're getting at with actions speak louder than words, that you can say all these things, but then you know, not only should your actions match your words, but uh, in some cases they, they speak louder than, than what you say. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, so the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it's never actually called a parable. 
you know, you know, it just says, and then Jesus said this. You know, other times, you know, the gospel writer Luke, for example, will say, and Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they should always pray and not lose heart. Uh, this time, Jesus just goes into it. You know, um, it's right after the parable of the unjust steward, which we'll hear about in uh, two months or so. That's always fun. Um, so it follows, and it also follows Luke chapter 15 with the prodigal son and the lost coin. And that. So, I mean, it follows in a train of a number of parables. So in, in one sense, it would make sense. Yeah, he doesn't call it a parable just because it's, it's following four other parables. Uh, however, that's sometimes a question is, uh, was there really a dude named Lazarus? We know a different Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. Um, you know, did this really happen? I don't know. It'd be, it'd be kind of interesting, though. Um, I think, not to bring us too far into Revelation, I think that some of the witness from the book of Revelation is that there, that there is some awareness in heaven of, you know, I wouldn't say of specifics, but of things going on elsewhere. Um, whether that extends to hell, you know, I don't know. Um, I think one thing in favor of it potentially being a parable is uh, the name Lazarus. Does anybody know what the name Lazarus means? Uh, close. Lazarus is the Greek translation of Eliezer, which is Hebrew for uh, God is my helper. So the rich man gets laid at, or Lazarus gets laid at the rich man's door who doesn't help him. You know, who does help him? God. So that, but Eliezer and Lazarus were very common names in Bible times, so it, it, it still could have been a real dude, but there's one argument in favor of maybe it's a parable. But if you want to think it really happened, that's cool too. I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, that doesn't bother me. You know, doesn't bother me. Now, well, let's come back into this though. So we, we're talking about actions and, and words. Uh, and this question here says, do you learn more about people from what they say, or by what they do. Do we learn about people more from what they say or, or what they do? What they do? Yeah, maybe more about the content of the person's character, maybe is what we're talking about. The word you're looking for is lie, I think. That, that's politics. What we need is more actual Christian politicians. Like I said before, we need more Missouri Synod people in politics who will actually uh, confess the truth and live accordingly. It, it would benefit our country greatly. Um, yeah, so we tend to learn about people more about through, through their actions, at, at least. And it says, uh, what do you tend to judge or evaluate people on more? Do you tend to... Yeah, how they live, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the... Right, right, we, we kind of see that, right? Uh, now, oh, this one. Look at your own words and actions. Do they always agree? Probably not. <laughs> Why? Yeah. As a parent, you're a little yeah, yeah, I see Doris went deeper. You know, the, you know, on the one hand, we say, yeah, because we're human. Uh, but, you know, go deeper. The real problem is, is of course, sin. You know, that, that's the real reason why we don't, for us as Christians, why our actions don't match our words. You know, and we find this. I mean, that's what we learn in the catechism, that we, we daily, you know, return to our baptism. You know, that we uh, commend ourselves to God's mercy uh, every night and wake up, uh, is as the new Adam in our baptism every day, you know, this cycle. Because we find that even as Christians, uh, through the fall, our actions don't always match our words. Right? Uh, now it says here, in the case of the God of the Scriptures, His words, His words actually, often speak louder than, or at least as loud, as His action. Well, that's interesting. So it says... Uh, Read Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, 
And then Psalm 19, 1 to 4. And for those of you on the live stream, uh, just get a hold of me and I'll, I can print this out and get it to you. I, I can't put it on the internet, I don't think, or I will get in trouble probably. Um, but if you'd like a copy of, of this lesson and there's four more, just let me know and I can pop it in the mail too. Um, but we're going to go to Romans chapter 1. And then Psalm 19. And normally I'd call on people. Um, maybe I still will. You just won't come up on the microphone too loud. That's fine. Uh, let's see. Could I get a volunteer to read Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20? Okay, so let's put our hand here and also read Psalm 19. Psalm 19, 1 to 4, which we should know because we sing it. Uh, it's the psalm on, uh, I forget what Sunday, but we do, we do, this, we do sing this one. Um, I don't think the whole psalm, but at least these verses. Uh, psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Right? Uh, so our, looking at this Romans passage in, in Psalm 19, it says, If God had not spoken to us, would we know that there is a God? You know, according to what, what we've just read here, if God had not given us the scriptures, would we know there is a God? Yeah. yeah. Right. You know. Right. Yeah, this brings us into the realm of like uh, uh, Platonics, uh, Plato, who believed in, uh, you know, the unmoved mover, that Plato was the one that came up with this idea that, that everything exists has a beginning. You know, therefore, there must be something out there that created all this. Um, you know, and it may might not have been Plato, um, but it was other one of the other. It might have been Plato. I'm not huge into Greek philosophy, but uh, the witness from Scripture here is that yes, uh, had God not revealed Himself to us in Scriptures, um, one one can have a sense that a God exists. You know, from where you know the sun. The, the, uh, the earth, we have food and oxygen to breathe and things like this. Um, this falls into the realm of what's called a general revelation, that um, there are people who don't know anything about the Bible, haven't heard the Bible, but believe that some thing exists out there. But that's the second part of this question is, it asks us, what can we know about God apart from him speaking to us? or even apart from him speaking to us. You know, uh, the, the witness of the scripture here is that, yeah, I mean, the, the heavens above declare you know, God, uh, that you know, creation itself is a witness to God, but what can we know about God apart from scripture? 
Maybe. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we can be uh, we can be sentimental and say that he likes beauty, you know, things like that, because creation. Um, the Romans were obsessed with that eternal power and the divine nature. Mm -hmm. That you know, God is. Yeah, that he's all powerful, um, that he exists eternally, perhaps. Um, can we really know about his character though? Very much. But that's in Scripture. Take Scripture out of this. What can, can we know anything about God? Yeah. 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 That God provides. We can learn that. Mm -hmm. Well, can we say love though? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's some quid pro quo. God feeds the birds. The birds give him songs. We don't know. I don't. I don't know. What you know? We kind of beyond you know God being all powerful, beyond Him providing for creation. You know, we kind of start to hit the limits of what's called a general revelation or natural revelation. You know, so the scriptures teach that apart from the Bible, you can know that there is a God. That's why there there are all these other religions that all exist. Is they make the same inference that uh, there must be a God for all these things to be. That's why there's so many different religions, because they all come to that same conclusion. However, you know, what we don't learn is uh, who is this God? What does he think about me? You know, does he love me? Is he going to smite me later? You know, uh, is he uh, not paying any attention and that's why all bad things happen? I, you know, that, that's where we... we hit the end, we can't answer that from, you know, the trees. The trees won't tell us that, you know, uh, not, not if we're being honest. Now, it says here, question number four, it says that already in Genesis chapter one, you know, Doris, to bring you back, uh, already in Genesis chapter one, God spoke. In fact, which happened first, God speaking or God acting? Well, let's go to Genesis 1. Let's see this. Mm -hmm. We have this little prologue here. Yeah. yeah. Well, verses 1 and 2, we have this little prologue. It says, uh, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Right, so if you want to like be nitty-gritty and uh, you know, look at verses 1, you know, verse 1 is kind of the introduction. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that tells us, well, how... And the first thing he did in verse 3, he spoke. God actually spoke first here. You know, and it says, notice that this pattern continues. Right? So verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20. 24, even 26, you know, that God spoke and then, and then, and then did, right? Uh, it says here, right from the beginning, what do these verses say about the nature of God and, and the speaking of God? Yeah. 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 Uh, God speaks, and then it happens. 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It just does. God, God's word does what it says. Think about, uh, think about the, uh, the sacrament and the altar. What makes the bread and wine Christ's body and blood? The, yeah. Yeah, the Word does it. God's power, of course, through, through the Word. The Word does it. The Word does what it says. Same with the absolution. You know, uh, in the stand by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. You know, the Word does it. Same with baptism. You know, God's word does what it says. You know, so at creation, when God says, let there be light, you know, then a bunch of Oompa Loompas came out of a, like a hole with really big flashlights in their, you know. Um, no, no. It, no, they're, uh, God's word does what it says. And the, the theological jargon for this is, Performative utterance, as in your, your word does what it says. It's kind of like when you tell your, your kids or your grandkids, stop doing that, and then they stop. Right? Your word did that. May, may, well, maybe the, the tone of your voice and the demeanor of your face, but your word did something. You know, now magnify that to you know, God level. You know, uh, God's word does. It, it works. It does what it says. Um, you know, that's how we respond to, like, uh, you know, the criticism of, of Genesis chapter 1, that, uh, you know, God said this, but really what he did was put evolution in place, and Genesis 1 really takes place over billions of years. That's not what happens when uh, Jesus says, uh, other Lazarus, you know, come out of the tomb. You know, Lazarus doesn't sit and think about it for a while. <laughs> comes right out. You know, I love that in the King James, because uh, you know Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days, right? Yeah, he stinketh in John chapter ten, where Jesus is like, "All right, let's get this baby open," and uh, Lazarus' sister is like, "Lord, he stinketh." <laughs> did he come out? Yes, he did. Ooh, I don't know. Did Lazarus continue to smell? You know. Or, or like, um, you know, uh, you know, Faith and I, before we had Gideon, we, we lost a child who we named uh, Talitha. You know, after Mark chapter 5, after the, the young girl that had died, and Jesus came in and said, uh, Talitha kum, you know, little girl, I say to you, arise. Then she did. You know, same thing. Jesus' word, you know, it wasn't he say, little girl, I say to you, arise. Okay, now bring in the paramedics. You know, you know, charged to 250 or whatever. Um, no, what he said did, right? So it says here that, you know, right from the beginning, we learn this about God, that uh, his word does something. Of course, he does speak and, and then does act. Um, now, question number five. It says, we communicate with others in, in a number of ways, you know, by... By what we say and then don't say, and by what we do and don't do. Uh, and it has been said it is better to keep your mouth closed and let people think that you are fool than to open it and remove all doubt. Okay? Uh, it's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think that you're a fool than open it and, uh, and confirm it, I guess. Right? Uh, what is the, the point of, of that saying? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, you know. So sometimes, yeah, you uh, betray your true character by speaking it in some ways. Um, you guys talk amongst yourselves for a second. I'm gonna stop by. Um, you guys want to keep going with the question? I'll be right back. We have a visitor coming in, so I'll take off the microphone. You guys uh, keep talking on that. Just 
asked if we would move our cars forward. Um, and when I asked him, when does that need to happen, he says, right now. So, uh, further up the, toward the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't recognize the guy, so we've had this before where people have come in during Bible study and have been looking for something. Uh, so I didn't know what the deal was. So, but let's pause here, move our cars. Yes, uh, on the live stream, uh, uh, a construction worker just came in and said that they are going to be spraying the road with oil and uh, we need to move our cars. So we're going to pause for a second and then come right back into this. Uh, sorry about that. So, <laughs> what an adventure we have today, right, right, uh, so this question is, you know, it's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're full than to open it and remove all doubt, and, uh, and maybe the, the point of the saying is that when you speak, you reveal something about yourself. You know, in this case, uh, your, your idiosyncrasies or uh, things like that, uh, you know, little foibles about yourself that would have otherwise remained hidden, but now you spoke uh, is the point of this, that the act of speaking, you know, reveals something about us. And in the case of this saying, unfortunately, sometimes reveals something bad about us. Uh, now, question six, though, it says, now, just the opposite is true when God speaks. His word reveals more and more of his wisdom and his goodness to us. In fact, it is only through God's word in the Bible that we are able to know God personally and hear of his plan of salvation. According to John 17, verse 3, why is it important for us to know God in this way. Um, so if anybody happens to have John 17 open, anybody want to read John 17, verse 3? Yeah, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ 
whom you have, have sent, right? Uh, so why is it important to know God than, than through the scriptures? You know, as opposed to believing in the God of nature. Can we know about Jesus from nature? No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus says that eternal life comes from knowing the true God, you know, and to knowing the true God through through Jesus. Right. Uh, this might be how you could respond to, you know, and I always love it when I get this. Um, you know, when I ask, you know, usually men uh, why they're not in church during the summer, it's because they're uh, worship, worshiping on the lake, you know. Um, they're, they're, they're worshiping God in the biggest church, you know, out in nature. And it's just like, that, that's not going to cut it, you know, because nature doesn't tell you that your sins are forgiven. Nature tells you you're going to die and something else is going to eat you, you know. Eventually, I mean that's that's what nature tells you. Nature tells you, you know, kind of not good things. I mean, I've watched all sorts of like, you ever see the clips of like the zebras down at the watering hole and then just, you know, big huge crocodile taking zebras and like little zebra babies and, you know, I love watching those videos of like those game reserves in Africa of like you can just watch like the lions. They always go after like the baby gazelles and things like that because they're easier to get. You know, right. What, what do we do with our babies and, you know, in our country? The same sort of thing. But you know, nature doesn't tell you about God or you know, who God is really or, or especially about Christ. You know, and Jesus says that this is eternal life, not knowing that A, God exists, but knowing the, the true God uh, and, and to knowing him, you know, which comes through, through Scripture. Right? Number seven, or question seven. According to the scriptures, God's existence, along with his power and his majesty, are revealed in nature. You know, and this is called the, the natural revelation or, or general revelation or, or the natural knowledge of God. All same sort of thing. However, Christians acknowledge that God more specifically reveals additional information about himself to us in the Bible. It says... Well, what are some things God reveals about himself in his word? Let's see. Uh, I'll take Malachi 3. Um, Pam, you want to take Leviticus? Uh, Becky, if you take Exodus. Uh, and Karen, you're in the back, if you take Psalm 90. Okay, so I'm going to start with Malachi, or uh, as I teach his confirmation kids, Malachi, the, the Italian prophet. Yes, uh, I, one of our students shared with me that she's heard that before. Uh, yes, uh, you know, from a previous pastor in Reedland, so. And I heard, I heard at seminary um, from Dr. Pulse, at the time, Professor Pulse, you know, he would always talk about Malachi. I'd be like, what? He's like, the Italian prophet. Okay, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. You know, so we learn from here, from Scripture, that, well, God doesn't change. We might also know otherwise, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever from Hebrews. Um, here God says he doesn't change. Uh, Pam, if you could read Leviticus 19, verse 2. Okay, so God reveals in Scripture his, uh, his 
unchangedness. Uh, he asserts his holiness here. He says, I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, what does he reveal about himself in Exodus 20? Yeah, God is a jealous God. What does that mean? That he's a loving God. Yeah. Yeah, what's, uh, what's another word we could use for jealous? Possessive. Yeah. Possessive care. Yeah. Possessive care. Yeah. Possessive care. Yeah. Like if you think uh, as scripture portrays, you know, uh, God and the church as husband uh, and wife, uh, another word you could use is zealous. You know, that he doesn't want to share his spouse with anybody else. That's not a bad thing. You know, just sometimes when we hear that word jealous, we hit, you know, a knee-jerk sort of thing. But that's, that's not what, you know, God's saying there. Uh, however, then what does God say in uh, Psalm 90, verse 2? Yeah, yeah, so God... Uh, he doesn't change. Uh, he is eternal. Uh, he is holy. We hear in, in Exodus that he is zealous for, for us, his bride, the church. Um, you know, we learn these things about God's character you know, in his word here. And it says in question 8 that even though God has revealed himself to us in the scriptures, are there still some things about God that remain unknown to us? Okay, so it says, see Isaiah 55, and in the epistle reading from Sunday, Romans 11, 33 to 36, that was, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how uh, unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Uh, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he may be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. Yeah, but Isaiah 55, does somebody happen to have that? Uh, Joyce? Uh, eight, eight and nine. Mm. Yeah, so my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, you know, God says. Um, so are there things that God has not revealed to us? Like what? Why? Um, the Trinity. Explain that further. I can't. Um, I said in my sermon this last Sunday, you know, we, we get that the, the, it's Christ's true body and blood. We get that it's by the word. How? Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. That's like the Trinity. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I always thought, you know, first the Father, and then the uh, well, maybe it's the Son, and then uh, somewhere along the line the Holy Ghost. But yet, again, in the Bible, it says, in the beginning, they were all there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to be like the Jehovah's Witnesses who say that that Jesus is a creation. You know, that that Jesus is part, he's the first, but he's part of this creation and not God in the sense that God the Father is. So we don't want to go off that rail. Yeah. Yeah, that Jesus is the Son of God because the Father... Uh, before all worlds begot the Son, that the Son is begotten of the Father of the same substance, we would say, that, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all God in the same way. Uh, neither the Son nor the Spirit are created in the sense that, that we are created. You know, um, that would be where the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, it's an ancient heresy called Arianism, uh, which is why the Nicene Creed was written, uh, to, to combat that, that no Jesus as the Son of God 
is not created. However, his humanity, you know, as we said in the Creed on Sunday, with respect to his divinity equal to the Father, with respect to his humanity less than the Father, you know, so that we would go that route of, yes, uh, when Jesus took on flesh, you know, he descended from heaven to take on, on flesh. He submitted himself to that. So we'd say, yeah, in that sense, Jesus' body is a creation, but the Son of God is not created which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, and the Mormons too. So we won't talk about those. Uh, but getting back into this, I forgot how I got off this. The, yes, things that God hasn't told us all the answers to. You know, the one that is something that we all experience is why do some people believe and not others? Why do some people who were raised in the church fall away and others don't? And why do others who weren't raised in the church you know, are brought to the faith. I don't know. I think the numbers are the numbers that you're referring to. Because when you bring up a child in the Lord, usually your family members are told to bring it up. Yeah. But unfortunately, it doesn't always end up that way. You know, uh, you know, and even we pray for Gideon, you know, that he has this terrible affliction of being a pastor's kid. Um, and sometimes, sometimes pastor's kids turn out rotten. In the end, you know, or they deny the faith. Even and, Madame Marie O'Hara, she's another example. Now she was so terrible because yeah. she brought her kids up yeah. that way. But yet, yeah. there was one that was truly a Christian. Yeah. You know who is a PK that ended up in a bad spot? Exactly. Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi? Oh, Whoopi. <laughs> she's a PK. Um, and she has, does and believes and says all sorts of unchristian things. Um, she's a PK. I didn't know that. Faith and I watched Star Trek, and then we watched Blue Bloods, and she's on um, Blue Bloods too. So then I was like looking at her Wikipedia page on the internet and reading about all, found out she's a PK. So, um, but that's the same thing. Is like, why? No, there's, there is still time for repentance. Um, you know, but that's, that's something that God doesn't reveal to us. I mean, in general, we say because of sin. You know, people reject the faith because they love sin and hate God. Uh, but why, when we get into specifics, that God doesn't reveal that to us. You know, and, and I said in my sermon on Sunday that, you know, we, we sometimes ask, you know, why not those people? You know, but what we should ask is why us, who if the devil just, got us just right, we'd fall just as easily. You know, that, that's what Luther says. Is everybody, everybody thinks, and we read this in the large catechism, that everyone thinks they're, they're, they're safe and good, you're the new man in Christ, and he says, and all it takes is one poison dart of the devil to bring you back down to the pits of hell, um, is what he says. And so, rise and soul to watch and pray. Get him him. Every week I'm going to make reference to that hymn. Anyway, uh, so God doesn't reveal everything to us. Um, it's not for us to know, like the Trinity, you know, much more than what has revealed in Scripture. You know, um, there are other things. How can God become man? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, how how does God's word work? I don't know. That's just how it is. You know, God doesn't reveal everything, but in some ways, I guess that can be good. I don't know if it's a bad thing that God doesn't reveal us everything. What would we have to look forward to if he did reveal it? <laughs> yeah, we already seen the whole show, you know. Yeah, yeah that's kind of like uh, if we already knew everything, what's there to look forward to? You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question number nine says, and we got we have three more questions, and we have eight minutes. Uh, words are often necessary in order to explain actions. I found that true. Uh, in the same way, actions can explain words. How do God's words and actions come together as one? Um, and let's maybe just do Second Corinthians one. 
verses 18 and 20. That will uh, get us to the right direction here. How are God's words and actions, how do they all come together? 2 Corinthians 1, 18 and 20 says this. Oh, I'm going to start at verse 15. Uh, Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do, wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh? Ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? Then verse 18. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Right? So it says, where, uh, you know, where, how do God's words and actions come together? Who is God's final and ultimate word? What, uh, what did Paul just call Jesus? God's uh, yes. That, that all of the promises of God find their fulfillment in Christ. And God's promise to be merciful, God's promise to forgive, God's promises to provide, you know, uh, are found in, in Christ. You know, that God's words and his actions come together in the incarnation. And we're going to spend more time on that, it says, uh, of course, in, this, in one of the studies is going to be called The Word and the Word Made Flesh. Now we have a couple questions to start to bring this together. It says, question 10, Stop and think about the ways many people are searching for God, for meaning in life and for a spiritual truth. Where do they look to find them? Okay, now, yeah. so people who are looking for, for truth, looking for meaning in their life, uh, for God, where do people look? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So some people, you know, are look to themselves. Uh, some people look to other people. Um, you know, I think most often though, it, it does end up in looking into yourself or some activity that you do. Yeah, you find meaning in life by, I don't know, some community activity. You know, that that's where you find your meaning. You know, but what about us? Where, where do we find out about God? Where do we look for meaning in life and, and, and look for truth? Uh, where, where do we look? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, faith comes by hearing, of course. Uh, you know, in many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But in these last days, how's it go? He has spoken to us by... The sun, yeah, yeah. So, well, the crowds turn to you know to to fishing, or uh, you know, self or, or you know sports, um, you know, and probably understood it can be okay to turn to friends, especially you know a good Christian friend, because you're expecting from your Christian friend for them to speak you know God's word to you. That, that's what you're looking for. It's same like when people come to me as pastor. Ultimately, they're not looking for me. 
of looking for Christ and looking to hear his word, right? Uh, you know, which is always a challenge as a pastor to, you know, not uh, be so full of yourself that you forget to talk about scripture. You know, it's always a challenge. Absolutely, all the time. Pray. <laughs> you know, um, particularly where there's patterns of, you know, repeated hurt. You know, there's not always, well, the answer is uh, we don't want to hear someday we'll die and not have to deal with all this. <laughs> You know, um, but I think finding patience in affliction uh, is, is a very important thing for us as Christians, and to be to be content with our suffering, because in our suffering we we share in Christ's suffering, as Paul would say, um, and to be content with that. That's not always what people want to hear. You know, when uh, people come to me, and sometimes they're looking for some deliverance out of, of, of a situation they're in. Uh, and I, can't, I can promise you an eternal deliverance, uh, but I, I will not promise you that this life is going to be great. You know, it's going to be filled with, through many trials and afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. You know, uh, as Paul says in, what, is it in Lystra or in Derby or somewhere, maybe it's to the Ephesians. might be to the Ephesians uh, where he says that. Um, and, you know, and that's hard. You know, because it's, it's very tempting to give all sorts of platitudes. Uh, and sometimes people look to the pastor for that. And uh, there may be times where I do that, but, uh, you know, that's not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is in Christ, uh, who suffered, but then rose from the dead. You know, and, and such will we. Uh, of course, here now by faith, uh, every day in our baptism, you know, we rise anew in Christ. Uh, we are strengthened through his word, which we talked about, and, and in the sacrament, of course. And then uh, when it is the Lord's will, we will be translated from the suffering of this world to uh, the joy of, of the world to come. You know? and, and it's okay for us to hear that, but that's not always what people are looking for. And so the challenge is to encourage them you know, to want to hear these things. You know, and and not always to look for earthly deliverance, which is not always the case. You know. uh, and there's been times where I've had people get upset with me, you know, where they're looking for some promise of deliverance here, and I, I'm just a dude, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. sorry. The, you know, the miracle has already happened. Christ has died for you. You've been baptized. Uh, miracles are happening all the time. Learn to see them. You know, things like that. You know, let's bring this together because we're, we're out of time. But we got two more questions here. 11, right? Three more questions. Oh, uh, maybe I'll leave that one. Uh, okay, the Bible is our only authoritative source for knowledge about God. Uh, there, God speaks about himself in his own words. And it's significant that the phrase, the word of the Lord came, is used over 70 times in the Old Testament. And it reveals that the God of the scriptures first comes to us and speaks his word to us. How does St. Paul make this same point in Romans 10? Uh, and then uh, if somebody could go to uh, Matthew 4, I'll read the Romans 10. Uh, if somebody would go to Matthew 4, and this will be our, our end for today. Um, you know, how does Paul make clear that, that God first comes to us? Uh, this is Romans chapter 10. It says, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? 
So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, so Paul brings up this point that you know, God promises in his word that those who believe in him will be saved, but how do they call upon his word? Well, he brings it to them. You know, God sends, uh, sent the apostles. He sends uh, pastors and, and us you know, to our children and to our community uh, to bring the word so that people might hear it and believe. But now it says here, what is the purpose of God's word and our search for a meaningful life? Uh, who has Matthew chapter 4? Uh, Pam? Yeah, what does that mean? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word uh, that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. What does that mean? Look at, the, uh, look at the birds of the air. They neither toil nor spin. Right? Or look at the, uh, the, the lilies of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow, and yet I tell you, Solomon in all his splendor is not decked out like these. Right? Uh, you know, and that ends with, uh, you know, but seek first God and his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Right? Um, that our meaning is not found in stuff, you know, uh, food, clothing, uh, but our, our meaning in life and our hope uh, is found in, in, in Scripture. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's easier said than believed, you know, uh, you know, and even for me as a pastor, you know, I'm not from Iowa, you know, I wasn't from North Dakota before I was there, you know, and I was fortunate in that, you know, I went to seminary right from college, uh, but there are a lot of guys that, you know, are called by the Lord later in their life, and they sell their house, quit their job, their wives quit their jobs, their kids move schools, they go to seminary, and who knows what's going to happen after that, you know. Yeah. You know, and that's just in my case, this happens in, in many people's lives, you know, of, you know, trusting God's word and uh, letting him figure out the details. But that's easy, easier said than done. Easier said than done. You know, because we want to have everything in order. You know, we want to know all the boom, boom, boom. You know, we want to know all the details. But God doesn't always reveal that. You know, it's kind of like a, I don't know if they still exist, but um, when I was younger, the hip thing was the choose your own adventure books where you would read these kids books and then you'd have two decisions to make, you know, two questions at the bottom. If you, if you want the character to turn left, go to this page. If you want them to turn right, go, you know, uh, you know, that's kind of what life is like maybe. I don't know. Only God chooses the pages. You know? Anyway, uh, there are, yeah, there are some questions. So you can take this home with you and, and look at these, uh, these remaining questions here. Um, and then there's some comparisons on uh, what do the different churches, you know, what do they believe about God's word? Um, some of them are similar to ours, some of them not. And maybe we'll, we'll take, a, if you bring this back next week, we'll maybe pick that apart. Uh, do you write a question at the end? Sure. Yeah, we, I mean, this is a lot for you to read at home, but do take this home um, and, and give it a look and, you know, these, these quotes, these comparisons of the different church bodies, these are all from official writings of those church bodies. So, so it's going to be, it's, some of them are going to be hard to read and understand. That's why, because they're like from official, except for the Lutheran one. That one's easy to understand. We know that one. Um, but like the, the Catholic one, that's kind of, you know, there's, there's, there's some word salad in there. Uh, but see if you can make sense of these, and, and we'll come back, you know, uh, and maybe see if you can find which one I like the most, 
and which one I like the least. And maybe I'll, and see, and I'll tell you why next week. All right, let's go ahead and end with a word of prayer because we are, we are well over, I do apologize. And then next week we'll, we'll look at this and move on to the next lesson uh, that is called, now that's inspired. So we're going to be talking about where does the Bible come from? Who wrote the Bible? So we'll have that next week. Uh, let us pray. Gracious Lord Jesus Christ, you are, as the scriptures speak, the word of God, uh, that you for us took on flesh to redeem us from sin, to save us from death, to grant us eternal life. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you have sent your word unto the ends of the earth where we have learned about you, about your love, about your character, and about your continued work on our behalf. We ask that by your same Holy Spirit you would keep us firm in this word, that we would find our, our meaning, our, our hope, our purpose, not in you know, things of this fallen creation, but in you, uh, in your love, which you have given to us so that we might reflect it also to those who are in our lives. Uh, grant us this day to be kept in safety. Uh, grant us by your same Holy Spirit to will and to do those things which are right and pleasing in your sight. Uh, and grant us to return here once again on Sunday to hear your word again. In your name we pray. Amen.